So when I was uh, on the faculty at Wayne State, uh, about for about 25 years, I was involved in the teaching of a variety of astronomy and astrophysics classes. And in these classes from time to time, we talk about the various observatories at which observations or discoveries were made. So once I was retired, I thought sort of a fun hobby would be traveling around a bit and visiting some of these sites that I'd been talking about for years. So I think up till now, I've been to maybe about 50 different uh, observatory sites. And it's uh, been a uh, fun experience. And in many cases, I haven't gone alone. I've had other people who have joined me. And I'll show you three in particular who've been on quite a few. So this is a couple from Oslo, Norway. This is Oivan and Ellen. And they here at the bottom of the Grand Canyon uh, on the Colorado River. Uh, and here's Ellen again. And then another person who has joined me on quite a few trips is Dr. Ismar Centora, who is a retired vascular surgeon who lives in Phoenix. And so in my pictures tonight, you'll see them popping up from time to time. And we're going to be visiting a variety of different uh, types of telescopes. So some uh, use visible light that we can see with our eye, for example, uh, telescopes in these two domes. Some are specialized telescopes like this one, which is a solar telescope and allows one to view the sun. Uh, we'll see a gamma ray telescope like this one. Uh, a radial telescope, this at the time the picture was taken, was the largest radial telescope in the world. And we'll see some arrays in which a variety of telescopes, particularly radial telescopes, can together to function as a single very large telescope. So when looking at visible light, uh, telescopes are often divided into two different classes. There are refracting telescopes in which a lens is used so that incoming light say from a star to the left uh, is refracted or bent by the glass lens and is brought to a focus point. And one can then look through another lens, uh, which is the eyepiece and inspect the image. Other type is a reflecting telescope in which there is no lens, which does the focusing. Instead, there is a curved mirror, as you see here, usually a parabolic mirror such that uh, the incoming starlight is uh, focused, uh, the image is focused with the converging rays of light, but before the focus is reached, another mirror uh, diverts the light off to the side, for, uh, forming an image out here, which can then be observed with an eyepiece. That way you can see the image without your head getting in the, in the way and cutting off the incoming starlight. Uh, sometimes the secondary mirror is rotated, so it reflects the light right back through a hole in the center of the primary mirror, and the image can be viewed back here. So we have refracting telescopes and reflecting telescopes. So here's the US, and Detroit, of course, is located approximately here. We're going to start out by visiting some nearby observatories. So we're going to go into Illinois, just north of Chicago, also a short distance up into Wisconsin. We'll then go to the east a little bit and into Pennsylvania near Pittsburgh, and then down into West Virginia in this vicinity. And then after the nearby telescope, we'll move uh, further out to the west. We'll go to California. We'll visit uh, the SETI headquarters down here. And we'll go to an observatory site that they operate up in Northern California. We'll also visit three observatories in Arizona, three observatories in New Mexico. So here we go. Uh, we're going to start with the Dearborn Telescope, which is not in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, the name comes actually from the wife of a person who was uh, mainly responsible for getting a telescope uh, brought to Illinois. It's located at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, just north of Chicago. 
It was ordered from Alvin Clark and Sons, which is located in um, Massachusetts by the University of Mississippi in 1860. Alvin Clark and Sons made refracting telescopes and they made five of the largest refractors in the world, each one successively being larger than the previous one. So this particular one at the time was the world's largest refractor. The primary focusing lens was 18.5 inches in diameter. And for about six or seven years in the 1860s, it was the largest refractor in the world. And with it, uh, they made the first discovery of a white dwarf star. These are little tiny stars. They may have as much mass as the sun, but they're about the size of the Earth. The original tube made from walnut is at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. It's used today in teaching astronomy lab courses, public shows, and um, at least pre-pandemic, they used to have it open every night from 8 till 10 p.m. Uh, for, for tours. I'm not quite sure what the schedule is now. But uh, this is the observatory building on the campus. You can't see the dome too well, but it's up here. Pretty much same color as the sky. Another view. And another view. So when we showed up Friday evening for a tour, here was a sign which welcomed us. And after waiting for a little while, we got to go in and see the telescope. So this is what the telescope looks like. And another view of the telescope. Uh, the big refracting lens is up at this end. And the eyepiece for observing, looking at the image is down at the other end. And this is the walnut tube in which it was originally mounted at the Adler Planetarium. Now, one of the nice things about traveling around visiting observatory sites is from time to time, they may be located close to other things of interest. And that gives us an opportunity to uh, visit those. So this um, observatory is just north of Chicago. So we thought we would spend a little while visiting Chicago. And as you can see here, Chicago has some big buildings, some really tall buildings. And some nice gardens, which you encounter from time to time. So this uh, is a very tall uh, building. This is the Willis Tower. Previously, it was named the Sears Tower. And for 25 years, it was the tallest building in the world. Right now, it's uh, third tallest in the United States. And we are interested in going up to the viewing area up high. And way up high in the viewing area, they got some little um, glass boxes that you can step out into and sort of be out there in, in, in space with the air all around you, which is kind of exciting. So we're gonna go up to the sky deck. And up on the sky deck, we're now looking out over Chicago and we can see some of the larger, the taller buildings. Uh, off in the distance, we see Lake Michigan. And here is one of the harbors uh, for the smaller boats, which you can see here. And here is Ellen. And she's uh, floating in, in air practically in one of these glass boxes. Quite exciting, actually. So here I am standing uh, in midair. If you look down uh, between my feet, we're looking down 1,350 feet to the ground below. So you can see down here at cars, small cars. This building is 1,450 feet high. In total, we are 1,350 feet above the ground uh, right here. And a few more pictures of Chicago as we walked around taking a number of pictures. This is down in the harbor area close to the water level. This is Millennium Park. This is a reflecting sculpture sometimes called the bean, although that's not the official name. Uh, some more gardens. And some artwork. And here I am uh, with a couple friends. 
Okay, moving on to our second story for the night. Uh, we're going to the Yerkes Observatory. This uh, turns out to be the largest refractor in the world. Focusing lens is 40 inches in diameter or one meter in diameter. Up in Williams Bay, Wisconsin, it's about an hour and a half drive north of the Dearborn Observatory. It was dedicated in 1894 and for about 50 years was operated by the University of Chicago, Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. Um, it was funded by an American businessman and financier, Charles Yerke, at the request of George Ellery Hale. Hale um, played a very important role in promoting the construction of large telescopes at his time, and this includes the 100-inch Yerkes, I'm uh, sorry, 100-inch Hooker Observatory out in California, the 200-inch uh, Hale Telescope out in Mount Palomar. So this is the observatory site and an aerial view. So the large dome that you see here has a large refractor and the two smaller domes have uh, telescopes which are more compact. The view outside, again, looking at the large dome. And here are people gathering for a tour. We are among them. So this is the main entrance, Yerkes Observatory, University of Chicago. And inside, here's the telescope, world's largest refractor. Very long tube, one meter diameter lens is up here. The eyepiece is at the opposite end. Okay, another view. I'm not sure who he is, but there he is. And it's mounted up here on top of a tall pedestal. When you get to the top of the pedestal by going up this uh, helical or spiral arrangement of stairs. Looks like this from the side. Couple more views. Uh, these large wheels that you see here with numbers on them are the setting circles. They describe the direction in which the telescope is pointed into the sky. Uh, there's an axis of rotation here, parallel to the Earth's axis of rotation. So as the Earth rotates in one direction, the telescope is rotated in the opposite direction around this axis, keeping it pointed at the same direction of the sky. And a final picture looking up. This is um, on the back side of the observatory building. Uh, a few flowers. And finally, a couple of pictures. So uh, for this visit, the three of us were together, uh, Dr. Centora, Ella, and Ivan. Okay, now we're gonna go off in the opposite direction to the east. We're gonna to go to the Allegheny Observatory. This is uh, located in Pittsburgh. It's about a 4.3 hour drive from Detroit. Um, this um, observatory was donated in 1867 to Western University of Pennsylvania, later became the University of Pittsburgh. And there are three major telescopes, a 13 inch refractor, a 30 inch refractor, and a 30 inch reflector. Uh, at the time, they also had a small transit, which could be used to establish accurate time. And if you wanted to really know what the time was, you could subscribe for $3,000 a year, a lot of money in those times, and you would be updated uh, via telegraph as to the exact time. So they did a variety of research there, studying stars. Uh, you can also get free two-hour tours from 8 to 10 p.m. Thursday and Friday evenings, April through October, at least that is the pre-pandemic schedule. So let's see, this is in Riverview Park. And this is the observatory building. There are three domes, there's one and two, little bit of the third one here. And from another direction, we have domes one, two, and three. So we are waiting here to get in for the tour. 
There is the 13 inch refractor. Here is the 31 inch refractor. It's the third largest refractor in the US. So pretty significant in size. And here is a 31 inch reflecting telescope. And here we are in the larger dome with the refract the largest refractor. And this is the individual who conducted the tour the evening that we were there. Now an interesting site, which is about an hour's drive away, uh, maybe, yeah, about an hour's drive, is Falling Water. This was the weekend home, which was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright back in 1935. It was built for Edgar Kaufman, who was the owner of Kaufman's department store in Pittsburgh. It's built uh, partly over a waterfall, 43 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. It's listed in the National Historic Landmark since 1966. And really important, it's listed in the Smithsonian Life List of 28 places you must see before you die. So if you haven't seen it yet, it's not that uh, far away by car. So here's what it looks like. Uh, it's uh, built on several different levels. You can see some people up here at the top level. Here's the waterfall. I will show you a few different views of the house taken at different times from different angles. This was in the spring when there's a fair amount of water flowing over the waterfall. And here we are in the fall, there's not as much water flowing and the leaves are changing color. Another view. Okay, a little bit of the interior of the house. Looks pretty comfortable to me. I think large enough you could hold a pretty good sized party here. There are lots of drinks also. Okay, moving on. About a three hour drive, three and a half hour drive south of Falling Water, going down into West Virginia, is the Green Bank Radial Telescope. This is the world's largest fully steerable radial telescope located in Green Bank, West Virginia. It's in what's called the US National Radio Quiet Zone, completely shielded by the Allegheny Mountains. They uh, strongly, um, prohibit uh, the use of uh, radio, like cell phones and so forth, so it's radio quiet. If you go there, there's a gift shop, there's a cafe. You can take bus tours. Uh, at the time, it was $6 per adult. They only use diesel buses because internal combustion engines with spark plugs generate radial noise, which would interfere with the operation of the telescope. So let's see, 17 million pounds primary reflector is 100 meters by 110 meters. It stands almost 500 feet tall. And the area, the collecting area, the main reflector can be measured in, in sorry, acres, 2.3 acres, the area of two football fields. So this is the museum area. This is uh, right outside the museum is this, which is the world's first parabolic radial telescope. It was um, built and operated by Reber, uh, Grota Reber, who lived in Illinois back in 1937. And for about 10 years, he was the only radio astronomer in the world. So this telescope is 31 feet in diameter and it served as a prototype for many radial telescopes that followed. And it has moved around a bit. It was uh, sold at one point to the National Bureau of Standards, moved to Virginia. Later, uh, the National Radio Astronomy, or NRAO, National Radio Astronomy Organization, moved to Boulder, Colorado, and eventually ended up in Green Bank, West Virginia. And it's listed on some uh, national registers. Yeah, another view of that telescope. And this is the individual, Grota Reber. 
This is the Science Center and Museum. And because the telescope there is looking at radio waves, this museum has a lot of displays primarily about waves and their properties. And here's a little display again on that same telescope. This is a model of the current telescope there, the Green Bank Radio Telescope. Again, almost 500 feet in height. And here at the next display, it's a little disturbing, disaster and loss. What was that about? Well, this was not the first telescope that was built there. This is the first telescope. Somewhat different design. This is more of a front view. This is a side view. Well, uh, one fine evening, a little after 9 p.m., um, there was a mechanical failure. I think it was back in 1988. And this is what happened to the telescope. It collapsed. So it's obviously no longer useful, but they were able to get funds together through Congress to build the one that we have today. And again, this is the model of the current radial telescope. So if you go down there, they have a cafe, you can get some food to eat. They have a nice dining area here, nice tables and a view out through the windows. And you can see the telescope off in the distance. And just outside, we have the Green Bank Telescope observation deck. You can observe from here if you don't want to get too close. So that's what it looks like across the farm fields off in the distance. And zooming in a bit, that's what it looks like. Of course, we took the bus tour and were able to get much closer. So this is what it looks like as you get close to the telescope. This is named after Robert uh, Byrd, who was a uh, senator, U.S. senator from West Virginia. And he played a primary role in pushing this project and getting funds uh, through Congress. So they have named it after him. And a few more views of that telescope. World's largest fully directional uh, radial telescope. It can point in any direction in the sky. And so this is the main reflector. Here's the secondary reflector and the detector. Receiving antennas up here. And just for comparison, there's a little person here to show you the scale. Can't even see it in this, so they've expanded a bit. This is the size of the person compared to the 500 foot tall radial telescope. Okay, a few more views. So you can rotate it around this circular track down here and point it up and down as you go. Well, there are a few other radial telescopes in the area you see here, there, here are two more over here. But this is by far the largest. So a little bit more about that telescope. It's the world's largest moving land object. Completed in 2000, the operating budget is $10 million per year. And it has uh, made a number of discoveries as indicated here. It's playing a major role in a project called Breakthrough Listen, which started in 2016. This is a $100 million project lasting over 10 years to search for extraterrestrial intelligent life, listening for radio signals they might be sending out. This is sponsored by Russian tycoon Yuri Milner. And um, this particular telescope, they use 20% of its observing time for that project. Previous telescope, the one that collapse was a little bit smaller. It was 90 meters in diameter, erected in 1962, uh, collapsed um, November 15, 1988. Okay, let's uh, go out west. So now we're going to go to the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. We're going to be up at an altitude of 7,200 feet. So telescopes which look at visible light uh, the light coming from distant objects like planets or stars is affected, is distorted by the atmosphere that, that, of course, we need to breathe. And so to reduce that effect, 
It's very useful to go up to high elevations where you're above a certain fraction of the atmosphere. This particular observatory was founded in 1894 by Percival Lowell. The main telescope is a 24-inch Alvin Clark refractor and made by that same company. Percival Lowell, looking through the IP, thought he could see canals on Mars. Apparently, this was an optical illusion, but for years and years, he studied what he thought were canals on Mars, and he drew intricate diagrams of what, these, what the canal pattern looked like. Um, it was all spurious, none of it was real. Clyde Tombaugh, however, discovered Pluto at this site back in 1930 using a 13-inch refractor. So this is a pretty large place. They got over 100 staff members today. They have a very nice visitor center, uh, the Steel Visitor Center, opening up in 1994. They also operate a fairly modern um, reflector, which is 4.3 meters in diameter, the Lowell Discovery Telescope. A great deal of the funding came from the Discovery uh, uh, TV channel. So here we are in the main campus in Flagstaff. This is the building in which that large refractor is located. And now this individual is going to go in and tell us a bit about that telescope. You see he's wearing a red shirt and he's, uh, got, he's got a jacket, but he's not wearing it just under his arm here. Fairly warm day, he doesn't need the jacket outside. Uh, here's a couple of views of that telescope, the 24 inch Alvin Clark refractor. This is where the eyepiece is. And here's that same gentleman uh, telling us about the telescope. But you notice now he's got his jacket on. The reason being it's much colder inside the observatory because they keep the temperature there 24 hours a day as close as they can to the outside temperature at night. That way there's not large changes in temperature which could uh, distort uh, the lens over a certain length of time. So try to maintain the temperature inside at outdoor night temperature. And this is just one example of what Percival Lowell thought he saw on Mars looking through his telescope. You see a pattern here of what he thought were canals which were produced by intelligent Martians. Of course, today we know that that's not the case. Nearby, they have a uh, display of the solar system to scale along the sidewalk. So here's the sun, the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And on that scale, this is where you'd find the asteroid belt, further out Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune's behind the tree. And if you go towards the end of the sidewalk where you'd expect to find Pluto, instead you find this observatory, small observatory. And inside the observatory is the Pluto Discovery Telescope. This is where Clyde Tombaugh uh, made his observations and ultimately in analyzing the photographs that remain, photographic prints are put down here, he discovered Pluto. Okay, another view of that same telescope. You might wonder, what is this boxing glove doing up here? Well, that's to keep uh, visitors from hitting their head on this steel pipe or steel rod that's sticking down here, which would be uncomfortable, not so bad with this cushioning blow from the boxing glove. Well, there's a number of studies that they do at the Lowell Observatory. Now, a number of them in our solar system have also been doing some uh, exoplanet, that is planets going around other stars uh, investigations. Also nearby is something of, of a lot of interest, especially to people interested in astronomy. This is Meteor Crater, just 40 miles east of Flagstaff. It's the uh, most well-known, best-preserved meteor crater on Earth. And here you see it. It's, about, it's a little more than 4,000 feet in diameter and was formed by the impact of an iron nickel asteroid about 50,000 years ago. It's estimated that the asteroid was about 150 feet in diameter, coming in at about 26,000 miles per hour. 
4,000 feet in diameter roughly and almost 600 feet in depth. And there is a visitor center here, right here on the rim. So for a relatively small admission, you can go in and get a good look. There's also a trail along the rim, which goes about a quarter of the way around. So this is what the viewing area looks like. Again, uh, close to a mile in diameter, almost 600 feet deep. So they've got uh, several different viewing areas. Here's one a little bit lower, one a bit higher. Meteor Crater. Okay, from Flagstaff, Arizona, we're going to drive about four hours to the south to Tucson and then drive an hour to the west. We're going to go, we're going to, go to Kitt Peak, Kitt Peak uh, Observatory. This is uh, 6,900 feet above mean sea level, MSL. It's supported by the National Science Foundation. The land is also leased from a Native American Indian tribe which actually owns the land. And they've got, well, several telescopes. The major ones include the McMath Pierce Solar Observatory, which has a focusing mirror 1.6 meters in diameter. This is the largest solar observatory in the world until a couple of years ago. There's now a larger one on Maui, one of the, the um, Hawaiian islands up in the top of uh, Haleakala. The biggest telescope here is the Mayall telescope, four meter uh, reflector. There's also a 2.1 meter reflector, and I'll say a few words about that, because that, that's of some historic interest. So once you get up to the observatory site, one can look down at the road that we took getting up there, and going up these mountain roads to the observatory can be, uh, Rather exciting at times. And some interesting um, geography off in the distance. So Kitt Peak National Observatory. This is operated by the Association of Universities. Um, and there's a Michigan component. The listed down here is uh, University of Michigan. And as you can see, they've left one line down here, one spot where we can put Wayne State University right there. So this is a big um, 380 degree uh, display. Shows about a dozen um, telescopes, a little more than 360 degrees. As you can see, these two telescopes are reproduced on the other end. So we're, go we're going to uh, focus initially on this telescope right here. And it looks like this as you get closer. This is a solar telescope designed to study the sun, only the sun, quite large in size. This is a diagram of the facility. This is a McMath Pierce uh, solar telescope. So what we saw was a part which is above ground, which is right here, but there's um, a component below ground, which is even longer. So there's a heliostat, a uh, rotating mirror up here at the top, flat mirror, which directs the sunlight down to the focusing mirror, 1.6 meters in diameter, reflected back up, and the converging rays of the sun go into the observing room, which is uh, located right here. Now, this is McMath Pierce Telescope. The telescope which preceded this one actually is right here in the Detroit area. It's at uh, Lake Angeles, just 30 mi 35 miles to the northwest of Detroit. And it was the McMath McMath Halbert Telescope, uh, built by McMath and McMath, father and son. The same McMath that you see here. And that was for many years operated by the University of Michigan. Um, no longer operated by them, and it's not in use right now, but one can make arrangements to go out there and get a tour of a facility which is similar to this, very near the Detroit area. So you can actually step inside this tube. This is looking out. 
And the time we were there, they were having some technical difficulties. They weren't taking observations. And so a few of us were invited in, into the observation room. So this is one of the people invited in along with us. And we took a few pictures inside and it was very nicely explained to us. So here's the 2.1 meter telescope. Does. This is what the telescope itself looks like. Uh, starting in 1968, this was used by Vera Rubin, and she used it to measure the rotation rate of spiral galaxies. And after acquiring quite a bit of data, what she observed is that there had to be far more, ma far more mass in these observatories than the visible stars, gas, dust, and everything else. And so what she was actually observing or detecting was what today we call dark matter. One of the early detections of dark matter made with this telescope by Vera Rubin. In her honor, there's a large telescope now under construction, uh, which is being built down in Chile. Okay, a few more of the observatory domes that you see. This is the Mayall, the biggest one on site four meter diameter mirror. And inside the telescope looks like this. Primary mirror is down here and the secondary mirror up here. Can't get a very good view because the enclosure is so small compared to the telescope. You can't step far enough away from the telescope to get a very good picture of it. It's like trying to take a picture of an elephant. You can only hold the camera six inches away. Uh, you can only show small parts of it at a time. Okay, let's go to the Carl Jansky VLA, very large array. And that was a hat I was wearing earlier, the VLA, very large array. This is located uh, in New Mexico, um, 4,000 feet above sea level, 50 miles west of Socorro, New Mexico. There are 27 individual radial telescopes which are arrayed in a Y structure. And they're interconnected to function as one single giant telescope. Each arm of this array is 13 miles in length. And each of the 27 telescopes is 82 feet in diameter, weighs 230 tons. So these are quite large telescopes. And if you spread the telescopes out, you can get the resolution of a single antenna, which is 20, 22 miles in diameter. So I'll show you a few views of the array. Here the dishes are brought in quite close together, which allows you to see a larger region of the sky. You want to see a small region with uh, great detail, then you spread them out far apart from each other. So this was the visitor center. Uh, when we were there, it was a cloudy day. It was actually snowing off and on from time to time, kind of blustery. But here are a number of pictures we took of the telescopes, individual radio dishes. Here's one up close and getting even closer and looking up. Looks like that. They have a building there in which they can bring the tele telescopes in individually for servicing. And they conduct a variety of studies from the VLA, including uh, the sun, uh, radiation belts on planets, uh, quasars, radio galaxies, supermassive black holes, pulsars, supernova remnants, um, the cosmic background radiation, which is uh, a remnant of the Big Bang that we think uh, generated our universe. Okay, let's go to California, where we will encounter the SETI Institute. SETI, S-E-T-I, stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Headquarters is in Mountain View, California. This is a nonprofit research organization incorporated in 1984. And the mission, as explained here, is to explore, understand the origin and the nature of life in the universe. 
So they have a lot of activities, including a variety of outreach activities and seminars they sponsor. They also operate the Allen Telescope Array at Hat Creek Radial Observatory, 300 miles to the north. This was the cup I was showing earlier. There from that location. So here we are at the SETI Institute headquarters in Mountain View. This is the building, our garden, and this is the entryway. I'm taking a picture here, giving a slight picture of myself in the reflection. So this is the office of Jill Tarter, uh, who's very well known, quite famous. And she was uh, the director of the SETI Institute for a number of years. So I contacted her to make arrangements so that we could get a private tour. And she was able to do that for us. So she wasn't there at the time we were, but you can see a number of pl plaques and awards on her office wall. And as indicated here, uh, back in 2004, she was on Time Magazine's list of the 100 most influential people in the world. Yay. Uh, this is a little better view of her. They have a display there, the Allen Telescope Array. And this is where leaving to take a picture of us. Uh, Ismar and myself are together on this trip. And we then drive for five hours, 300 miles to the north to the Hat Creek Radio Observatory, about 70 miles from Redding, California. And as mentioned, it's the home of the Allen Telescope Array. This was funded by Paul Allen, one of the co-founders of Microsoft. He donated uh, $30 million to this project. And this array of telescopes was uh, built between 2005, 2007. It consists of 42 telescopes, each 20 feet in diameter. And again, Jill Tarter uh, played a prominent role at SETI Institute and the operation of this site. So after driving 300 miles to the north, we are entering the radial observatory. At Creek Radial Observatory, it is open to visitors. Uh, the gate is open, so I, I like the gate because we have a silhouette of a moose here. And again, Hat Creek Radial Observatory Allen Telescope Array. And here are the individual telescopes that you see spread out, each 20 feet in diameter. So this is a close-up of one of them. This is Ismar taking a picture. Might see a little snow up in, up in this region. Uh, we're just north of the Mount Lassen Volcanic National Park. And here's something a little exciting. Don't get too close to the antenna because they can move without warning. But even more exciting, there are rattlesnakes in the area. So uh, had to keep an outlook for those as we were walking around. This is a diagram. Uh, it detects radio waves coming down in this direction. They hit the primary mirror. They reflect it into a secondary mirror and then down to a detector, which is located here. And in the control room, you can see lots of optical fiber cables, which are bringing signals in from the individual antennas. Like so. Okay, let's uh, go off to uh, Arizona again. We're gonna go down to Tucson. We're gonna go to the Stewart Observatory Mirror Lab. Here they produce very large single mirrors up to 8.4 meters in diameter about 27 feet, and they use an oven which is spinning. So they melt the glass in the spinning oven and the rotational motion uh, causes the molten glass to form itself into a paraboloid of rotation, which is exactly the shape that they need. So the spin casting was developed by Roger Angel, 
back in 1980. And for the biggest mirrors, they can use up to 20 tons of boral silicate glass, which they melt at almost 1200 degrees Celsius. Currently, they're making mirrors for the giant Magellan telescope, which is under construction down in Chile. It will consist of seven mirrors, each of them 8.4 meters in diameter. So this is just outside the observatory, the mirror lab, which is under the football stadium. And we have to wait here for the tour to start. Can't bring in any guns or knives or bicycles or dogs or cigars. So we left all those outside. And here we're getting our tour. I like this guy. I liked his name, Jerry. And uh, this, this is an artist uh, depiction of the Large Magellan Telescope. So you see the seven individual mirrors. They act as a single mirror and they reflect the light up to a secondary mirror. That converging light is then reflected back through a hole in the uh, center of the middle or the center mirror where it's detected. So this is under construction, has been since uh, 2015. They think they'll have it assembled sufficiently that first light when they first start using it uh, would be back around uh, 2029. Well, this is what just one of those seven mirrors looks like. This is how big they are. One mirror, this is the person here in the center. So they were in the process of polishing one of the mirrors, one of the off-center mirrors. They didn't get a very good picture, but this is a small portion of that rotating oven that they used. And when they melt the glass down and, and form the giant mirror. Okay, from here, we're gonna to go to the MMT telescope and the Fred Whipple Observatory. So the MMT telescope, uh, this represents the multiple mirror telescope, which at one time consisted of six individual teles uh, mirrors, each 1.8 meters in diameter, and the configuration could act as a single telescope for about 20 years. And they have since replaced it by a single mirror, 6.5 meters in diameter back in 2000, and this was the first large scale spin casting using the uh, Roger Angels uh, technique that I described earlier. So this is located on Mount Hopkins, 40 miles south of Tucson, at an altitude of almost 8,600 feet above sea level. The, the building it's housed in uh, rotates, the entire building rotates, and is supported by ball bearings. Uh, this is the Smithsonian Institution. And just behind the buildings here is Veritas, Very Energetic Radiation Imaging Telescope Array System. So this consists of four 12 meter reflectors that you see here. We're picking up gamma rays, energetic gamma rays coming from outer space. These gamma rays collide with uh, air molecules in the upper atmosphere, breaking them apart, giving them an enormous amount of energy so they come streaming down to the upper atmosphere at speeds in excess of the speed of light and air up there. And that produces a type of radiation called Cherenkov radiation, which these telescopes detect. And this is one of these gamma ray telescopes up close. So here's where we're going. We're going, this is the observatory up here. You can't drive up there. They take you up by bus. So we're in the bus and they're driving us up. And it's quite a way, like 18 or 20 miles as I remember. We're getting closer and closer. About halfway up, we stop for a quick view of a couple other telescopes, smaller telescopes. This is the Smithsonian 60 inch reflector over here. Uh, Smithsonian 48 inch reflector. Here, tour guide was explaining a little bit of what we were seeing. And they also have another gamma ray telescope there. So uh, there's a platform right here that you can get up 
here to the secondary mirror or detector that might be there. You go up a series of steps to the platform. So I'm in another couple of pictures. I'm going to go up those steps, take a picture of my reflection in all the mirrors. Uh, but first, I take a picture from the ground. So what you're looking at is Ellen and Ivan and myself reflected in these individual mirrors. And now I've gone up the steps. And so my image is greatly enlarged. I'm taking a picture of my reflection in the mirror. Uh, my hat here says Antigua, one of the, the islands out in the Caribbean. Another view of the gamma ray uh, telescope. And to get up higher, we can look back at the route that we took. This is a windy mountain road that we went up. This is a single lane road. So the bus that we're on, the driver has a uh, radial transmitter. He's in contact with everybody else on the road so that one or the other can pull off the road at a convenient place and not meet each other. So there's no way to get around each other. This was one of the most terrifying rides I ever took. Because I was sitting on the outside, on the right side, looking out the window. And in many cases, I couldn't see the road. All I could see was uh, almost straight down, hundreds and thousands of feet. I kept my fingers crossed, hoping that that was a very good driver and he wasn't uh, about to go off the road, in which case the bus would go end over end, hundreds or thousands of feet down the mountain. But fortunately, he stayed on the road. Uh, so looking back, this is where we saw those uh, earlier telescopes and the gamma ray telescope here. A little bit higher up, we can look back again and see the, that of those two observatories, gamma ray telescope. And here's where we're going. This is NMT observatory. And we're there. Can't step back very far and get a picture of the whole building because you uh, fall off the mountain. And inside the observatory, again, like taking a picture of the elephant from a few inches away. You can only get a little bit of it at a time. So this is a secondary mirror. Secondary mirror a little bit closer. And down below is part of the support mechanism for the telescope. So uh, back in the earlier days when there were six individual mirrors, it looked like this, and they all functioned together as a single mirror. And then after year 2000, they replaced it with one mirror. And that is the mirror, 6.5 meter diameter. And in 2009, there was a major update. People are standing here for a photograph. Uh, again, the me reflecting mirror in the background. Okay, let's see, continuing on. We have the Apache Point Observatory. Now we're going to New Mexico. We're in the Sacramento Mountains in Sunspot, New Mexico, where they've got uh, one, two, three, four major telescopes from half a meter up to 3.5 meter. The 2.5 meter telescope, it was used and is used for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey starting in the year 2000, um, measured the distance to some 4 million galaxies, uh, allowing them to make a three-dimensional map of the universe. And the three and a half meter is used for Project Apollo. This is a, a, the Apache Point Observatory Lunar Laser Ranging Operation, Apollo. And they use it to send short bursts of laser pulses up to the moon, which are reflected back from five retro reflectors on the moon. And they can measure the distance now to the moon to accuracy. So the distance between the center of the Earth to the center of the moon to an accuracy of one to two millimeters, which is important uh, for uh, investigating general relativity and its precision. So uh, here we're driving up to the observatory, and off in the distance, this white streak you see is part of White Sands Missile Range, or the missile range out here. And we're approaching the observatory. 
And let me take a look at the individual telescopes. This is a smaller one, half a meter diameter. It's inside this enclosure. This is a Sloan Foundation 2.5 meter telescope. It's located under this structure. This structure is in roller bearing, so it can be rolled back from the telescope, which stays put. This is the big telescope, 3.5 meter telescope. Uh, this is it. And this is Ismar getting a picture. And the next slide, you'll see him up here on this, standing by this rail. So here he is. And over here in the distance is something. And if we zoom in, this is a, another solar telescope located in Sunspot, New Mexico. Okay, so now the doors are open. Looking back, we can see the 0.5, the one meter, and the 2.5 meter enclosures. And when they're open, telescopes look like this. This is 3.5 meters. This is this is the one meter, 2.5 meters, and the 0.5 meter. And people, for comparison. So here we are standing by the 3.5 meter telescope, and they're lifting up the bath or the covers that protect the mirror when it's not being used. So now they're fully up and you can see the mirror behind us. And it looks like I'm moistening my lips here because pretty dry up there. We're up there pretty high and uh, the air is dry and cold. This is the mirror, 3.5 meters, a little more than 10 feet in diameter. And here's our target for the night. It's the moon. Moon in the first quarter phase. There are five of these uh, laser retro reflectors on the moon. Three were left by astronauts from Project Apollo, Apollo 11, uh, 14, and 15. Two were left by the Soviets. They had two rovers up there that had these reflectors. So the telescope sends a beam of light, which is about a mile in diameter when it gets to the moon and bounces off these individual reflectors one at a time. They measure the time for the pulse to go up to the moon and come back again to the accuracy of picoseconds, trillionths of a second. This was our astronomer of the night. This is uh, Russet uh, McMillan. Uh, couldn't get a good picture because she was moving all the time, getting ready for um, the night's activity, which included bouncing lasers off of all four of those reflectors on the moon. Now this was taken at a different time, but actually you can go out in the dark while they're sending the laser pulses up and you can see it with the naked eye. So this is what it looks like in this particular picture, which was taken during a uh, partial eclipse of the moon. It looks like this is a sea of serenity. Looks like they might be going maybe after uh, Apollo 15, which is right there. So let's see, time is flying. So here, yeah, what's going on here? Here I am by, it looks like a radioactive fence. Caution, radioactive materials. Well, actually the fence isn't radioactive, it's what's beyond the fence. So where are we? We are Trinity site. This was the location of the first atomic bomb test back in April 16, 1945. It's located within White Sands Missile Range. They tested the first atomic bomb which made use of plutonium. And the explosive yield was equivalent to about 25 kilotons, 25,000 tons of TNT. It was detonated atop a 100 foot steel tower. It produced a crater about half a mile in diameter and eight feet deep. This site, the radioactivity is down sufficient now, hopefully, that they let the general public in the first Saturday of April and October. So we planned our entire trip around that date. It would be open when we got there. So this is the 100 foot tower. This is the one I put a photo of the actual bomb itself. First test, another picture of that same bomb. 
Then a few pictures taken right after detonation. So this is six thousandths of a second or six milliseconds after detonation. You see this, 25 milliseconds after detonation, this, 53 milliseconds after detonation, and about two seconds after detonation, you see the uh, familiar mushroom shaped cloud which is forming. And then looking down afterwards, this is a Trinity crater that formed. So hey, we're here, Trinity site. So we're gonna go in and have a look, hoping the radiation is indeed down sufficient. So this is the gate, it's open. So it's a bit of a walk down there. But here go a bunch of people, not too afraid of radiation. And we're getting there, uh, not supposed to remove Trinitite, uh, when the bomb went off, it fused, melted the sand, which was here on the surface, forming kind of a green glassy material, which they call trinitite. And the government claims that, and you're not supposed to take it. Otherwise, you can pay a fine and go to jail. So there's a memorial here, which is right at ground zero. That's the memorial. This is right at the center where the tower stood. And this is the remains of one of the legs of the tower. And this is about Fat Ma'am up. This actually is a casing of the bomb they used. Uh, the Second World War came to a very sudden end when they used this bomb, bomb of this size, dropping it on Nagasaki. This is the bomb that ended the Second World War very quickly. Nearby, this White Sands National Monument, since our visit has been promoted and is now a national park. But it's quite a scenic area. Here's a wide angle view. It consists of about 230 square miles of this white uh, sand, very white, and uh, the type of vegetation which grows in desert areas. This white sand is about 30 feet deep on average and it forms dunes up to 60 feet in height. So we encountered a couple of gals who wanted their picture taken. And so Ismar is uh, taking their picture. This uh, white sandy material that you see are small crystals of gypsum, calcium sulfate, gypsum. Okay, and then the Dan Zawada Observatory is the Wayne State University's observatory. Um, it's located out in the desert of the high desert of um, New Mexico, more than 4,000 feet above sea level. It's a 20 inch or half a meter diameter robotically and remotely controlled reflector located outside Rodeo, New Mexico. Population 101. So this city doesn't uh, generate much light. So they have some of the darkest skies in the continental US. Very good place to have a telescope. This telescope was donated to Wayne State University by the 419 Foundation of Russell and Stephanie Carroll. And is named in honor of Dan Zawada, who was a Michigan amateur astronomer who died of cancer at the age of 54, unfortunately. It's used by Wayne State for teaching and research purposes. For research, uh, one of the members of our faculty, Ed Cackett, uses it to study matter falling into supermassive black holes at the center of distant galaxies. So this is a rodeo, an aerial view of Rodeo, New Mexico. 101 population. The observatory is off in this direction, a couple miles away, going from rodeo off that way. So this is what the land looks like around the observatory. See a little bit of snow over here in distant mountains. And this is rodeo as seen from the observatory. 
uh, the Dan Zawada Memorial Observatory donated to Wayne State October 14, 2017. It's, uh, it's protected by one of these clamshell observatory domes, looks like this, which is uh, 12 feet in diameter. So here are a few pictures I took when I was there. This is the electrical power coming in, transformer, which gives us 110 volts on the ground. We have a weather station at the observatory. And here's the clamshell observatory dome. No, it's a two by four here. Another picture. The day before I arrived, there was a mechanical breakdown of the mechanism that opens and closes the dome. And so the dome was left open and exposed to the element. Rain was expected to come. And so Russ Carroll drove himself in his van over here from San Diego, California, out here overnight. So he can manually close the dome and hold it closed with the two by four, so it could be repaired. So this is the view I got inside of the telescope. Now, since that time, a wall has been built around the telescope to protect it from the wind. And so the next few slides I'll show you were taken by Ed Cackett from our department when he was out there. There's the telescope. So uh, here's, you can see the mirror down here, 0.5 meters, 20 inches in diameter. And I'm just gonna finish up, about a 20 mile drive away is this, which is the remains of a telescope built by Tom Clyde, uh, sorry, Clyde Tombow, who discovered Pluto. So the reflecting mirror is no longer here, but there's the instrument. This is Terry, an amateur astronomer from Tucson, who is giving me a tour of this area. Okay, and I'm gonna stop here because I see my time is up. Um, I had one more that I was going to show you. Steve, do you think we should go for another seven minutes or bring um, that now? Because I can always show this last little bit at the next um, tour that we have. Um, I can, how would I do the poll first? And then if folks want to stay, you could do it. Okay, that sounds good. Up. All right, so I'm gonna put up a poll really quick of where we should go in the next um, meeting, uh, the next journey with Jerry. So you should be able to see the poll up right now. So um, the two options are, oh great, it's, it's cutting off the full description, but one would be a visit to two really big machines, LIGO and the LHC. The other one would be flying private airplanes around the country. Unfortunately, it's cutting off the full words. Could uh, could you remind me what- It says, and doing? a rocket launch from, uh, from Kennedy Space Center. And I know the one is the Large Hadron Collider, but what's the uh, LIGO again? Mm, LIGO, that's a gravitational wave detector. Light Interferometer Gravitational Wave um, Observatory. Still a few more votes coming in. If you want to still vote and haven't voted yet, I'll give you like five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. Um, the winner was the visit to the two really big machines. So that would be our next journey. Um, yeah, they, they, these are big machines. Their dimensions uh, are measured in miles. Biggest machines on earth. That will be an exciting one. Um, but uh, yeah, if you want to show that other slide, that way if folks want to stay, they can, and then we'll get to the <clears> Okay, yeah, this will probably go about another five to seven minutes. Okay, so the, uh, my last telescope I'm going to show is um, the Arecibo Radial Telescope, which is in Puerto Rico. 
And this was a tour I was on with the Planetary Society. Um, so uh, the telescope that we're going to see at the time was the largest single aperture radial telescope in the world. And the main reflecting dish was about a thousand feet in diameter and its spherical surface was accurate uh, to within two millimeters everywhere. So it's been used for radio astronomy a, a variety of different purposes. So this is what a, an aerial view looking down in the main reflector, thousand feet in diameter, incoming radio waves are reflected at the two detectors. This is one of them. And there's another one over here that doesn't show up too well. So um, we flew out of Miami over to uh, Puerto Rico, where we spent a couple of days. And then after Puerto Rico, we, let me get this out of my way, maybe. Uh, we flew down to Barbados, had a tour of Barbados, and then we got on the world's largest sailboat. And we sailed up among the Lesser Antilles Island, such as St. Lucia, so, uh, Dominica, Guadalupe, Antigua. And so, oh, here's St. Martin up here. So we'll take a look at that. I'm gonna move things out of my way. Um, oops. So, here's where we're going. So we flew down. We landed in San Juan, and we then took the bus to Arecibo Observatory. So uh, here we are at the Miami airport, American Airlines, ready for departure, flying over the Caribbean, looking down, landing in San Juan. This is the hotel we stayed in, very conveniently located just one block from the beach. Very nice beach, as you can see here. And the next day we go to the Arecibo Observatory. At the time, the world's largest single dish radial telescope. And here we are. Uh, these are the two detectors, uh, an antenna here, this dome here. And looking over the rail, you can see the large reflector below. So here's a bit of that reflector. And there was a, a group of students, um, local students that were there. And four of these gals are here wearing the same type of sweater advertising the school. So looking down more directly at the reflector. So again, this was the largest reflector and it weighs 300 tons. And if you wanna walk on the reflector, you have to have special shoes to distribute your weight and not damage the reflector. There's a better view of the two detectors of the radio waves, which are reflected back up. You get up there, there's a catwalk suspended in space that you can go on. And even as we were looking, here goes some engineers or scientists uh, up the catwalk. This is one of the towers that supports the detectors. And here's uh, three members of our group looking down at the reflector. Uh, this is Bill Nye, the science guy, who um, is the president or CEO of the Planetary Society. So he was with, with us on this trip. This was our local guide for the whole trip. One of the astronomers who works there explaining the operation of a magnetron, which is used to generate pulses of microwaves which can be used to do radar astronomy, bouncing uh, radar beams, asteroids, and other objects. Uh, Varian uh, magnetrons or klystrons. Relay racks that were used in the electronics in the control room. This is sitting here at the control desk. And uh, that was a little bit. With, says that we were here January 25, 2012, and the time was 2.39.59 p.m. AST, Atlantic Standard Time. 
you can look at this from several different levels. So here, down here at a lower level, looking. This is one of the another one of the astronomers who was with us on our tour. Just looking at the reflector from several different angles. And then they, and then looking again up at the two detectors. You can even go underneath the reflector where they took us. Reflector our head and we're walking down, down the path. And here we can look through the reflector up at the detectors, the antennas up here. So the reflecting surface is not solid. In fact, it has a lot of holes in it to reduce the weight. Other view underneath the reflector. And they list here a number of accomplishments which have been made using this radial telescope. First, you detect the rotation rate of Mercury, measure the rotation rate of the Crab Pulsar 30 times a second, and uh, first radar image of an asteroid, and uh, well, a variety of things. Distribution of ice at the poles of Mercury. Uh, some SETI searches looking for extraterrestrial life and so forth. So here's a group photo, it's just about a dozen of us, so not a very large group. Uh, guy who was leading the tour for the whole 10 days. Ismar, myself, uh, Bill Nye, the science guy. One, two local astronomers. And we flew down to Barbados, had a little tour of that island. Show you a few quick pictures of Barbados. Some interesting rock formations along the coast. And then we ended up by going on a ride for about a week in the world's largest sailboat. This is the Royal Clipper. It's the world's largest square rigged sailing vessel. 439 feet long, 5,000 tons, 42 sails. So I'll show you a few pictures that we took. They put us at one time in a boat, a fast boat, so we could go round and round and get pictures of the large sailboat under sail. They got some dolphins, some whales. And here are the rat lines, and here goes somebody up the mast part way. So they let us, um, if, we, if we were brave enough, to go about 50, 60 feet up the mast. And they got somebody up here, somebody up here to keep an eye on us so we didn't fall to our death. So of course I went up and I got some uh, gear which I'm wearing, a harness I'm wearing. So I'm attached to something and can't fall. Here's a view from the stern. Also did some hiking on some of the islands. Here we climbed up about a thousand feet uh, to get, get a view of the our boat and a vill nearby village, airport runway. More of the sailboat under sail. So here we're welcome to Martinique. And each of the islands, uh, we had a tour lasting a few hours. So we could go out and see things. This was a very nice garden on Martinique. And there is some very nice flowers. And that is my last slide and I have finished. And I thank everybody for their patience. Those of you who managed to hang in all this time. Wow, those are, those are breathtaking there with the, in the water. Um, one question we got was, is there a difference in like the image quality between a, a refracting and a reflecting telescope? Uh, no major differences, no. There's, there's a few little minor things, but, but they are the same diameter and the viewing into the atmosphere is the same. They will produce images which are pretty equivalent to each other. I haven't seen any other questions. Um yet. Lots of wonderful presentation messages. We had uh, Jeffrey Sheen who took your class uh, 1991 saying wow. how great it was to hear this and see you. He says you haven't changed. Uh, <laughs> that was, uh, 
grown four or five years older since then. <laughs> um, let's see, do we have other questions coming in? I don't see any other questions yet. Did you see any, Megan? I don't think so. Um, I feel like I had one at the beginning, but I forgot to write it down. So I'll ask you later, Jerry. When okay, I that's it. fine. <laughs> uh, do you know if, um, this is a side, I guess, but for the Trinity visits, um, do you have to make a reservation to be one of the visitors for Trinity or is it just open to everybody? No, no, I, don't, no I don't think so. No, okay. you just have to show up. Okay. I Sure, we did not. It's, it's, you, can, you can look up online uh, the times. It's two days out of the year, the time that it's open, and you can drive down there and they have a, a pretty large parking area where you park along with the. We got there right when they opened, and there were only a few cars at first. But by the time we left, they were streaming in by the hundreds. So, no problem getting in, no delay. That went very quickly. Um, someone asked, have you visited Mount Wilson? Mount Wilson Observatory in California, up on top, top. how do you visit it? Uh, you just drive up there. Uh, it's open to the general public and you don't need a, they have tours. And I think if you take a tour, you can, you can uh, buy a ticket right then and there when you're on, the, on location. But they, it's pretty well set up for self-guided tours as well. Uh, I'm going to unmute uh, Rochelle B has a question. Her hand is up. Yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice presentation. It's a nice presentation. Like, it's a oh, nice thank presentation. you. So my, so my question is how you, how you, how you got involved, involved in loving, of loving research, researching, uh, researching by telescopes, like how you, um, how you okay. become, how, how come, how come tele telescopes are your favorite? How come you're a big fan of, of telescopes? <laughs> oh, well, I, I grew interested in astronomy when I was quite young. And I bought my first uh, telescope from Sears Roebuck and Company when I was in the seventh grade. And I got it, I unpacked it and went out that night, started looking up in the sky and just by sheer accident, one of the first things I looked at was Saturn. When I saw Saturn with its rings, I was hooked. I thought, this is really cool stuff. And I've been very interested in astronomy ever since. That's such a cool answer. Well, that's, that's the way it happened. And just uh, traveling with Bill Nye, the science guy, no big deal. <laughs> well, that was fun also. Yeah, Ismar and I had dinner with him uh, one evening. Was it that trip? Yeah, I think it was that, that trip. Uh, there were just four of us at the table, Bill, Ismar, and I, and somebody else. So we got to sit around for two or three hours and talk, which was lots of fun. Um, any other questions, anyone? Well, thank you again. Jerry, that was pretty amazing to see just all the different telescopes in the United States alone. Well, there are quite a few more. Wow. Round two. <laughs> I, th I think yeah. I went, yeah, well, I've been to about 50. I showed a dozen tonight. Wow. There's another, probably another 20 or so in the US. Wow. Well, that would definitely be a good one in the future. Well. Thank you again, Jerry, and you know everyone for attending. And we'll see you for the uh, the really big machines. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night.